connected through someone in Austin, which oh, I know I this happens that. all the time, I guess, nowadays, but in a way it was also just kind of sort of one of those new things for me where kind of just by, you know, Kevin Bacon, basically, we ended up <laughs> um, <laughs> connecting, and, and here she is talking to us about UX, which is really cool. So, yeah. um, cool. Claire. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Kevin Bacon was at the Write the Docs. That's how, <laughs> that's right, yeah. that's how that came about. Um, so, hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? It always sounds weird from up the front. Great. Um, so thanks for coming. Um, so I'm going to talk about today is the writing less and saying more, which is UX lessons from mobile, from the small screen. Um, you might want to kind of prepare yourself with some sunglasses or something like that. It's a little bit brighter a presentation than some of the ones I've seen and you might have seen in this room. So just giving you fair warning, um, trigger warnings on colour. Um, so the sessions mostly, I just want to talk about mostly about my mobile experience and the reason I want to talk about it that way is because a year ago I didn't really work on mobile, I didn't really know much about it, I didn't know about the kind of user that used it and that kind of thing and so I kind of want to share it from the perspective of these are the things I've uncovered. Maybe you know these things, maybe you don't and, and, and hopefully the gaps are filled in. <coughs> so just as is tradition, a bit about myself. Um, I've been a tech writer for about 12 years. Um, I started working at MYV Software uh, for about six years, and then I went on to do contracting work um, in a few different industries, fuel industry, change management, training, knowledge management, education, all kinds of areas. So um, mostly doc sort of stuff, but some of it bigger architect information, architecture projects and that kind of thing as well, which was really great. But now I'm back at the coalface, I'm, I'm back at it um, kind of working in the really UI end of things, right where the user kind of sees everything. Um, so I work on Jira Mobile, you will have heard of Jira probably. Um, <laughs> and I work on a product called Jira Core, which you may not have heard of, which is kind of just one of our versions of the application, which is kind of for a business audience, so not, not a developer audience necessarily. Um, so the things, kind of things I do is name the buttons and the error states and do the uh, labels and names and those kinds of things, which I think is the small stuff, which is actually really the big stuff. And the kind of writer aim is kind of important to the topic as well, because it kind of explains some of the challenges I've had um, in using, uh, learning to be a UI writer for mobile. Um, so the kind of writer aim is I think about my user as someone I need to help do something, not someone I need to give necessarily give information to, that might be a byproduct of me helping them to do something. Um, I'm trying to clear the way to their good experience of a product. Um, my aim isn't to give them a great reading experience, it's to give them a really good product experience. Um, so that means helping them do their task and actually get the thing done, get them back to work. I don't want them to spend time in my docs, I don't want them to kind of dwell on that kind of uh, information. So when I rest out on working on a new product, um, I need to know who this user is and who is the user for mobile. That was the first thing I kind of asked when I joined the mobile team. Uh, and it's critical for me to understand this in order to write to that right audience and especially for UI where you don't really have a heap of opportunity to really, um, really target some of your information. It's really small and micro. So that's really critically important. So one of the first things I heard when I started for mobile, and I still hear this quite a lot, is that the mobile user is on the go, right? They're a person um, who is in transit, they're on the move, they're walking, they're on public transport, that kind of thing. And this makes sense, of course, because it's mobile, so you are mobile, um, <laughs> it kind of is obvious. Um, and of course, but people, you know, you do this, so they text and walk quite annoyingly. Um, they use uh, mobile in their car, um, at their desk, even when they've got a laptop in front of them. Uh, so some of this mobile stuff is actually only, the on-the-go stuff is actually only part of the time. It turns out we actually use our devices a lot when we're sitting on the couch. We're actually just on the couch. I, I know I use mine most heavily when I'm either sitting at my desk or sitting on my couch. So I'm engaged, I'm not on the go, I'm not fleetingly um, looking at things. So yeah, um, we've got the agreement kind of that um, mobile is used everywhere, so public transport, shopping, um, while you're out it to lunch, all that kind of thing at events. We upload photos and do all that kind of thing. But it doesn't automatically follow 
that mobile is about where we are. Um, there's a stat, this stat, 84% of smartphone shoppers use their phone to shop while they are in a store. So there's this definite connection, and there's other stats that are kind of similar to this, that there's a connection between the mobile device, the location, and the action or the thing that you're trying to do, shop or, or kind of whatever it is. So that connection's kind of undeniable. And devices are capable of changing our experiences hugely, so of banking, of shopping, of learning, of arguing with people, all of that kind of stuff. But the device is actually just a means to my actual purpose, what I'm actually trying to do. So regardless of where I am and what I'm using, it's the what I want to do that's, that's the kind of important thing, win that argument, use the banking app, all that kind of thing. And that kind of describes what the user experience is, the combination of those things, and not just on the go. Another misconception that I kind of ha already had about mobile was that a mobile app is the light version. So it's kind of the cut down version or the concise version of the real thing. And when a user actually wants to do the real work, they'll go to the web for it. And that an app might be just, you know, the key functions kind of thing. Um, I don't kind of agree with this use of light, by the way, but I kind of just <laughs> used it to illustrate the point of it being diet, kind of. Um, so this is kind of, we're talking about the, my perception that apps are low fat kind of websites or um, functions that we perform, programs. And the, this light idea kind of persists um, and the thought that users will head um, to the web to do the real work. So this leads me to think, okay, so that means mobile is about miniaturising and abbreviating and making smaller and it's actually about sort of the, um, the content uh, being more compact and just um, smaller so it fits the device. Um, and responsive design does this a lot, so web content, which is full content, responsive design kind of compacts it and reorganises it so it does fit mobile. But kind of what I'm mostly going to talk about today, because Jira is a native mobile app on iOS and Android, so which is a little bit different than um, responsive design. So the same principles don't quite apply. Well, same principles apply, but we don't go about it the same way. So if you just think for a second about your own mobile habits, um, what kind of apps you use every day, say Facebook and banking or Google or Maps and things like that. And just think again about what, what do you go back to your computer for? Is there anything that you go back to your computer for? Or do you expect everything to kind of be available on mobile? And as you're kind of thinking about that, think about whether you really expect there to be sort of diminished capability on a mobile than you do on the web. And I think if you really answer that, if we all answer that question, the, the honest answer is no, absolutely not. I do not want to accept that the functionality will diminish just because, you know, the, the size of the thing um, changes, the size of the device changes. So I want to do the same thing on mobile and web. Um, but this changes kind of the way I have to think about it then um, because it means that the user is actually sort of more demanding in the sense that I need to come up with simpler ways to represent the same thing, but on a smaller screen. Um, so there's kind of this inverse expectation when it comes to mobile, that it's actually kind of better. And part of that is that it's mobile, and part of that is that it's more concise and lighter, even though it's not. So this led me to this conclusion. Mobile users are very needy humans. <laughs> Kudos to anyone who got that. You're in my age bracket. <laughs> um, where they want function and ease of use and all of the same things you get on web, reliability, good design, consistent logic, um, the good communication that, um, that you come to expect from any kind of um, web interaction. So in a nutshell, people want parity. When I hear the word parity, I know what it means. I hear people saying, I want this here and I want this here as well. But what I kind of actually hear as well is, please translate exactly this thing from this larger device to this smaller device and probably don't even think about it too much. Just do it because that's what I want. And that's very, very problematic, as you know. That's why responsive design exists, etc. cetera. Um, is that we actually translate mistakes then from web to mobile. 
So the same kind of things that annoy people on web can annoy people on mobile. So this is welcome to the parody party. And this is the hardest party you've ever been to, even if you're not a bit socially awkward like me. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Jira, probably lots of you. Um, so Jira is Atlassian's main product. It's a software development management tool and it's actually really complex to use or to set up, I should say, and customise and use really well. Um, so it was built by engineers for engineers. So that's kind of like the foundation of the product. Um, and engineers love it, love it for the most part. But it's in the last five years that um, design has become a really big leading force in um, the, the building of Jira. So design teams now kind of co-lead product development and really consider things like um, uh, you know, design and spacing and architecture and navigation and lots of those kinds of things. But that stuff's really hard to change because there's a big legacy that we're kind of building out from. So we still have this legacy for mobile, the complexity. And when, I, when the mobile team kind of formed, which kind of happened just pre-me, not too many, few months, I kind of thought that the mobile thing would be an opportunity to have a kind of clean slate because we're building native, so we can kind of build from the ground up and we kind of get this clean slate and this opportunity to kind of really um, evolve some of the architecture and maybe uh, experiment with some of the ideas we had for, for web. But this is kind of, this is sort of the state of the mobile now. And as you can see, it's kind of like three lists. So we started, when the app started, we released it as it was an activity app. It was released as a kind of, minimum viable product, let's say. And we started to progressively deliver some of the complexity of the product, such as boards and filters and a few things like that. Um, but we've also, you can see, translated some of the inherent kind of complexity of the product. And that's kind of visible where, I mean, Jira is just a giant engine and kind of a list of things to do that kind of gets organized into different ways, like boards and um, uh, issue kind of filters and that kind of thing. So it is a listy sort of product, I guess, anyway. So that's what we ended up with, kind of lists. And we kind of stuck to a similar architecture, you know, the navigation along the bottom and um, kept it kind of simple. But it still looks kind of hard to me. And it looks like I can't distinguish. And there's no home screen. These are the three screens that you kind of mainly work in. So it's hard to can, like, represent the complexity of Jira really simply. That was a really obvious problem that I saw. So another unfun thing about parity is that there's lots of jargon when you translate a product from web to um, uh, mobile. You also bring along with it the jargon, kind of some of the, like I said, the mistakes maybe that were made on the web. And if you know Jira at all, you know that there's jargon everywhere. It's like issues, workflows, custom fields, screens, nested, this and that. It's quite difficult to get to know. And while we haven't built some of that functionality in, we have kind of brought across some of the um, labels and kind of symbols and uh, persistent kind of elements um, that are from the web. And they serve as functional cues, like they're necessary because we want users to be able to go from the web and start using mobile and understand what's going on. You actually have to have that parity. I'm not saying parity is all bad. So, in a few examples of how we kind of try and minimise the noise of the parity though, so the, the noise is that everything that you see on the web gets squished into mobile. So some of the ways we try and do this, uh, to avoid this rather, is to just minimise the amount of labelling and things like that we do. So the actual navigation functions do only show the name when you scroll across instead of actually showing it the whole time, so it's sort of less noise. Um, we use lots of functional icons, which is pretty normal in mobile. You replace things like words like create or add and things like that with your buttons and search gets replaced by icons and stuff like that. Really universal kind of stuff. Um, another example we have, and I quite like this one, is this is a shake to send feedback. And I think this is a really good example of the kind of concealment of the complexity that I really wanted to get to. Uh, on the desktop, you have to kind of find the contact us and feedback button or that kind of thing and it opens the modal and you type in your feedback and send it that way. In mobile you can actually just shake the phone while you're in the app, it takes a screenshot of whatever screen you're on and you get this open message 
that you can see there and you can type. And while you know the feedback loop is important, um, there's kind of like not a lot of top level interface required. Um, so that's just kind of a good thing. There's not a whole lot of um, space taken up for that function, um, which is, as I said, the kind of um, austerity and concealment of um, some of the complexity. So you would think it would be easy to kind of think of ways to kind of conceal some of that hard stuff inside the app somewhere. But it's actually kind of not. Um, there are ways to keep the UI clean and sort of lean and stuff like that. And that's kind of what I'm going to move on to talk a bit about. And that's about how context can be really a lot better than words. And that's things like, um, you know, having a screen design and function suggest what has to be done, um, making discoverability easy and that kind of thing, um, to actually use the context, which is kind of like, I guess, a, a combination of the designers and the uh, developers working together with me to communicate kind of the functions of the product um, so that they're carrying and sharing the burden of the communication of the product. So, I mean, to me, design and IX, so we're information experience team, <laughs> to mention that. Um, design and IX work together because we're the communicators of the product. Design is communication, words are communication. And building, developing is communication as well because you're actually making something functional. So those three kind of, the tension of those three things is kind of what um, makes for a product communication. So context can't do everything though and I do actually have to write some words sometimes <laughs> for mobile. Um, so when I do write though, there's a whole lot of other challenges that go with this. Apart from the miniaturization, I've got small micro screens and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> that is a huge consideration, of course, space. There's just not a square to spare and there's often character limits and things like can't go onto three lines. By the way, this is quite a bad MRO message and I'm sure I rewrote it, so um, please don't um, pay too much attention to the content there. Um, and we inherit some of the uh, native styles of things like this. So there's, these are, I think that's a toast, maybe that's a toast, um, and the kind of pop-ups and, I don't know, they have names for them all. Um, but I have very limited space with which to work. So I need to be able to communicate stuff but not make it in such a way that it's robotic as well. Um, sometimes it doesn't have to be very much and sometimes, um, like, sometimes I get a bit more room and so it can be slightly um, different kind of messaging I can use. <clears throat> so without much space, one of the main um, approaches I take as a writer is to sweat the details, as we call it. Um, so sorry, talking about sweat a bit, and I have sweated a lot over this particular thing, which is push notifications. So I guess you're probably all familiar with what a push notification is. It's the notification you get on your home screen when you get an email or that kind of thing. You can turn them on and off on your phone and that kind of thing. They're kind of different to an in-app notification. They come out the app. So this space, this kind of looks pretty straightforward. Like it's not a big space to work with, but there seems to be elements in it. And you know, you would think that this is kind of easy and straightforward. Um, but with Jira, lots of stuff. So when you get an email, it pops up and says, got an email and you know what this subject line is and that kind of thing. It's pretty simple amount of information. With Jira, a lot goes on. So there's activities, people change the status of something, they assign you work, um, you know, things move on, sprints get closed, things like that. There are, um, so there's a lot of information we have to kind of cram into this space and how we organised it is actually kind of something that we sweated and asked about a lot. Um, I just should add that these, the kind of the push notification design is native, so we don't get a choice as to how much is heading and body and that kind of thing. There are line limits and all of that kind of stuff. So we have to squeeze the existing information into the native um, component. So the elements of a push notification in JIRA are, you know, an icon, there's the action, the thing that happened, the person who did it, the time it happened, the ID for the piece of work, the name of the piece of work, um, if there was a comment, what the comment was, the response, there's inline response kind of uh, tags, etc. 
So when we think about, so not all of these things have to appear at once on the push notification um, for different things uh, at different times, but how do we know what's actually important to the user? Like how do we know whether the person who did the thing is more important than the actual thing that happened? Or how do we know that the thing that it happened to isn't more important than the thing that happened or the person who did it? So that might look like this, say, this is, this is an example that, that puts the uh, what happened up front, you know, new comment. Is that important to me? Will I open it? There's a new comment, but what is it on? Is that meaningful to me? This one's who did it. So you might open up and kind of go, oh, someone's done something and that's important to me. And it depends who you are. Your role might be the software developer, but so you might be looking for notifications from your team lead. But if you're a team lead, you might be looking for what happened on a piece of work. So that might be the piece of work. So you would show up, um, you know, constructed a totally different way. So you can see these at three are constructed totally differently about where the time is placed, about where, um, who's, who did it, whether there's emphasis on it, all of that kind of stuff. We can kind of um, construct these and we thought about these really long and hard because we needed to know what was important. And uh, a push notification is engagement with your app. So this is a touch point that's really, really important. How do I get people to go into the app? And we rely on DAO, which is daily active users, which is what we measure for our mobile performance. So it's important to us to get engagement, people engaged and using the app every day. So if the information we're surfacing isn't important to them, they're not going to like it. So how did we kind of do, figure it out? And we probably haven't completely figured it out. We just figured out one way to do it. Because we all had different ideas on the team about what it should be. And I always thought that, you know, the thing that happened would be more important, but someone else thought who did it was more important. And, you know, we could go around circular arguing for a while. But instead we did some AtLab user testing. And AtLab is the name for our user testing location in Sydney. Uh, we have this kind of dedicated room and we bring users in and interview them or get them to do activities, get them test design, have a look at sort of all kinds of stuff. So we did a card sort exercise to help them prioritise. And like this is really manual, so we cut out literally cut out pieces of paper and had them write them down and put them in an order and that kind of stuff. Um, it didn't have to be complex or too high tech. Um, we just had people do it. And look, there was quite a lot of mixed answers, but we got a lot of data at least anyway to kind of figure out um, the best way to kind of do it, which we did and we've recently revised, much to my delight. <laughs> so we're back at kind of the drawing world, I guess, again a bit. So lesson being, sweating the details is really, really important on mobile. Getting that stuff right is really, really important because it's the user engagement, it's the touch points, um, and you need kind of stamina to get there. You have to be willing to go through research and willing to kind of analyse and have circular arguments and try different things. Um, as much as we're kind of agile in our releases, it's not our release pipelines aren't lined up for mobile as such that we can kind of daily deploy and things like that. Apple has different requirements for getting things into the App Store and stuff like that. So we don't want to, we can't make mistakes and then turn it over really quickly. We have to be pretty sure. <coughs> kind of segueing here. Uh, it does relate to kind of the way I have to sweat the details because if you ever write for mobile maybe some of you do, there are what I like to call style nests. And like they sound quite delightful, cute nest of things, um, but not really. They're like hungry mouths to feed. So these style nests are um, things like, there's Atlassian guidelines for design. So our ADG, which tells us how to design for our own products, plus also anyone using our API to write uh, extensions and um, plugins and things like that have to use the same guidelines. And then there's the native stuff. So there's iOS human interface guidelines, Android um, material design guidelines, and then what I talked about before, the mirroring, the parity kind of stuff, which um, there's sort of nothing, well, the web version is the written down style guide for that. Um, and then of course there's discretionary styles, otherwise known as someone's hugely strong opinion about something mm -hmm. that they want to indoctrinate. Another thing about mobile, which I kind of found out when I started writing messaging, was that um, 
even though some of these styles formed patterns for us, so they form this kind of men, like vocabulary, visual vocabulary for the user to kind of keep doing things and, and build familiarity and touch points and um, stickiness in the app. So patterns are good. Repetition is not good. So they can be really close together though. Um, so one of the things being things like, so this is an example, every time you search and the search fails, you get the same message. And mobile is like this, you know, your screen's like this and error messages are small and uh, on a mobile, you kind of much more um, concentrated message. And seeing it and having the repetition um, actually kind of gets more annoying more quickly, particularly if you're not finding what you're looking for. Um, Tumblr actually does a really good job of this, of handling this pattern, which actually is, so the pattern's there, they all look the same, but the message is different each time. So they've kind of built in a, a kind of more interesting way to provide the same results. So that being a really good example of the difference between sort of pattern and repetition. So there's pattern there, but no repetition. Or if you fail the search enough, <laughs> you'll eventually get the same message. But they've got quite a lot. There's actually a really, really big library of them, I think. Um, and they're actually really fun to write, so I can't blame them for just wanting to make their library huge. And eventually I'd really like to do that in, in Jira app as well. And I think someone touched on this earlier about voice and tone in one of the presentations, just briefly. Um, voice and tone at Lassian is really important. We have a specific voice and um, I don't know if you, how familiar you are, voice is like your personality and tone is like your mood. So combined they kind of form a brand voice or a um, kind of a type of a way we kind of communicate. Um, so Atlassian has practical with a wink is our kind of tag for our voice. Um, but what we found, we did actually some A-B testing on messages like this. So this is like nothing to do. You can read that, I don't know. Um, enjoy the freedom or start a new task kind of thing. So it's kind of got some playfulness, but nothing too, um, nothing too wordy that makes people spend too much time on something like that. Um, so voice and tone is a kind of pattern too. So users get used to seeing things a certain way, uh, not just what they're called, but how we say things, what type of areas we throw up and stuff like that. So people get bored with the seeing the same kind of thing. Um, and what we test, when we tested these messages, we actually found they get bored with the fun too. So when you wink too much, it's like louder on the phone. Um, it kind of, the fun goes out of it really kind of quickly. Um, so we have to kind of really f strike a fine balance and we actually have a kind of sparring sessions around this kind of thing. Um, again, sweating those details out. So sweating the details, sorry, I keep saying sweat, sorry about the <laughs> perspiration of the details. Um, small stuff is really the big stuff. So you might think of a naming a button, and this is something I've had to really train my team to think about, is that when they go, oh, can you provide a label for this thing 20 minutes before they need the label, um, that's not really acceptable timing because actually I need just as much time to come up with that label as I would to come up with a whole topic document virtually for something, a new feature. Um, I need to think about, you know, the parity, the voice, and all, all of the things that kind of um, what I've just talked about. So all those details come into it for doing just one simple small thing. So I have worked enough, long enough with my team to um, train them to give me a bit more notice than 20 minutes on things like that. Um, and that's because they don't have the understanding of how hard or important it is to label that stuff and keep um, and contribute to um, the, the stickiness, like I said, of the app and the um, engagement. But they're really willing to contribute to it because they do know it's really important for us to get our DAO up. So I've talked about lots of the details and the small stuff and that kind of thing. So I want to circle back to the user because that's who, and the, I was really pleased, the users come up a lot in the sessions today because that's who we really work for. That's who we do all this for anyway. Someone at the end of the, end of the chain of the things that we do, trying to do something themselves. Um, but one of the main things that we need to remember when we think about them, and I, someone actually said this to me outside not five minutes before I've kind of come in this room, is you're not your customer, you're not your user. 
And we say this all the time, we are not our customers, we are not our users. Um, one of the main reasons that we do this is because we know our customers aren't all software developers now. Um, they might have been once, but they haven't been just that for a long time. And to be honest, software developers aren't just software developers a lot of the time either. They're documenters and QAers and all kinds of other kind of roles as well. And they function, the teams of these people, uh, teams of software developers and uh, the way they work with designers and everything has changed a lot, a lot. So we can't consider ourselves the model for what we want. So to kind of expand our knowledge about this not usness, um, we do lots of research. We talk to our users, we invite them in, we research, um, we have them in our app lab, which is so earlier, and do online kind of surveying and all kinds of stuff. We do heaps of it, because we want these insights into who the people are that want to use our stuff. And not just to sell more, but to deliver better, like to make something really good quality. Because another one of our values at the last year is to not fuck our customers. That's don't fuck the customer is one of our values. Sorry about saying that and probably recorded and everything. <laughs> um, twice. <laughs> But it's a really important value because it's about treating your customers as though they were your friend, um, as though they're kind of people that you would um, uh, want to work for and want to help and all that kind of thing. So it helps me and it helps everyone in the development team to think about the user as a real kind of person. And I'll just quickly run through some of the things oops, that we learned in user testing. And that's, these are really some really obvious ones. So people will abandon apps that are poor perform, have poor performance. And poor performance can be like, to the error message appears twice and people go, no, that's just annoying me or they have to log in twice or something like that and they'll abandon. Like people are really sensitive about performance. Again, it's one of those kind of amplified on mobile type things. Um, users w expect speed to completion. So if I want to upload a photo of something, I don't want it six steps or things to do. I want take photo, da, da. I want a really clear path and really good speed to kind of completing things. Um, people, we've discovered people have different points at which they'll go back to the web to do something. So some people will kind of get frustrated quickly and go back to the web and do it. Other people will expect the mobile to do everything and they will, web is like last resort for them. So we've got this whole range of users who want to engage in a different kind of levels of depth um, with the product as well. Notifications is a huge one on mobile. Um, can't be underestimated as an area, like what I said with the push notifications. It's an area that people use their mobiles to alert them of stuff, set alarms, uh, reminders, emails, all kinds of things, and control their lives. Like, you know, you lose your mobile, oh my God, your life implodes. Um, so notifications are really critical, and control of the notifications is really critical as well. So you just want to be able to switch on and off, uh, control what they get notified about, how often um, we're toying with, uh, kind of, you know, having a business hours on and off and a few things like that, that that exist out there. And a really obvious one, obviously value. People, you know, we don't want to fuck them over. We want to deliver stuff that they want to use. We want to deliver things that are useful um, and not just kind of use this as our kind of training ground for experimenting with new things. But what do you do if you don't have a whole lot of research kind of stuff at your fingertips? You don't have um, access to laboratories and all that kind of stuff. So I just want to briefly talk about, uh, the way we do this is we divide, we have thing, a thing called job stories and they're kind of similar to, I don't really like the term, but they're quite useful. Um, so when X, I want to Y, so I can Z and you know permutations of that kind of thing. So you will have heard of user stories, which is as a user, I want to blah. Um, this is kind of like, as a user, when this happens, I want to be able to do that so I can. You know, it's quite a, a more detailed um, description of why I want to do something and what my end objective is. Um, so an example of one from Jira is, when someone updates or comments on an issue I'm working on, I want to be notified of the activity so I can respond or take action. And this kind of story might make us think about, do we have inline push notification response or all kinds of things. We can interpret the story a few different kinds of ways um, for the design and the kind of um, feature that we're building. And it's really critical because the designer and the designers and uh, developers, as well as me, can kind of get a really good sense of who this, what this user is trying to achieve. Like having a detailed kind of description of a task actually makes it real 
it keeps it at that level of people actually want to do stuff. I did a quick survey before I did this um, talk too, which was about what people value the most about uh, mobile apps. And uh, design, surprisingly, design and quality micro interactions and that kind of thing was actually at the lower end of the spectrum. One of the most thing important things to them was that things are easy to use and they have a clear purpose. So uh, spending time on some of the um, things that uh, might delight or do that kind of thing, you think you're getting stickiness from that, but in fact, your ease of use and your clear purpose and things like that are the stickier things. It doesn't mean those things are unimportant, by the way, it just means they're less important. So this ease of use stuff is absolutely at the top of the, top of the um, importance chain. So here we are back at the user, because as far as I'm concerned, there's the only opinion that matters. If they stop using it, if they abandon us, if they um, like it and they deliver good reviews, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but that's who I really work for. I want to be communicating with them. So there's just the user and their objective and the app standing in between them and their objective. But there's also all this stuff standing between the app <laughs> and me and their objective, the word limits, all the small stuff, all those um, architectural things, all the information, the human factors, the on-the-go stuff, all of that kind of thing is sort of all mediating and, and kind of uh, uh, a barrier to having this great objective, reaching the objective. So how I see mobile uh, writing and UI design is a lining up of all these things. So they're all going to be there, um, but if we can get them all in a row and kind of see a really clear path, it'll help the user reach their objective, which is the ultimate place that we're trying to get them. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and we're perfectly timed to take I know, questions. I know, I didn't actually time it out. I was hoping to leave <laughs> 10 minutes. Well, we don't have quite 10 minutes. We have, no. I think, two. two. But two is good. That's two questions worth. Maybe one and a half. I'll just talk really fast. Uh, you mentioned notifications as being a very important part mm. of this uh, approach, and I agree with you. Unfortunately, at the moment, uh, you sort of have to uh, install very proprietary software to get these notifications. Are you aware of alternatives, and do you have um, uh, actually, are you pushing into that direction, or are you noticing people pushing into that direction to be more independent? Sorry, do you mean, I wasn't so clear, did I switch it off? Yeah. Well, the, the, the Google push notifications and, and Apple has the same, require you to actually have accounts with these, um, and, and some of us might not want to have that, or want to inform these companies of uh, yeah. all the we traffic. Yeah, we certainly wouldn't want to be doing that to people, absolutely, that would be a classic example of screwing over our customer. But that's what you're probably doing right now, unless you're going to tell me. We're definitely going to be looking at um, mitigating that risk. Awesome, for thank sure. you. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, in regards to your uh, user roles, uh, talking about the mobile, um, trying to figure out what your users are doing, mm -hmm. have you looked at what user roles exist within kind of JIRA and then how you can potentially target that for your design decisions? Yeah, we absolutely do do that, but it's quite limited in the sense of we still do that thing where we go, oh, we've got a developer and we've got the person who manages the developers. So we've pretty, we've got a reasonably, we started off as Jira Software Mobile 2, so we had those two simplistic sort of cases for it. And part of the user kind of testing and things that we're doing is to uncover some of these other types of teams and types of dynamics and types of roles that are trying to do it. So I kind of think the way the mobile app is now, the boards are there, so your team kind of people are covered your team leads and people controlling the work are covered and the kind of issue sort of stream and feed and your next task and to-do list and stuff like that are covering um, your developer. But there's a whole lot of gaps in, like there's huge amounts, so that's a spectrum, that's not kind of two distinct things. So we are working on kind of um, filling those gaps, but of course we went for the big users first and we'll have to address those discrete cases kind of in further feature development. All right. Uh, is it quick? OK. I'll answer really quick, too. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. 
how do you decide whether an icon is obvious enough to be used without a text label? Mm. In our experience, most icons are not, but there are very few that are. How do you decide? Yeah. Um, so I work really closely with a designer and we argue about this stuff all the time. Um, I usually never have the room to put a label in um, or anything like that. So we, we fall back on this parity argument, which is kind of why I'm sort of cynical about the parity, I suppose. Because some of the stuff on web isn't, some of the stuff on our web app is not um, familiar either. You know, the tiny icon that says a task or a bug or a, things like that. People don't kind of have that recognition. So that's really critically important. And it's something we've just hired a new designer. So I'm hoping that that kind of stuff is going to get really, um, I don't want to use words, um, but icons aren't always the answer either. So to me, again, it's that tension between design and um, the developers and me to kind of come up with a good communication model to kind of um, convey that to users as well, make that useful. Excellent. Well, please join well, me again in thanks. thanking Claire.